are confused about the reason and the duration of marriage. Pain and suffering of many are exploited by men claiming to have miraculous powers. However, amazingly, their demonstrated ability is totally different than biblical miracles. Miracle workers put on a magnificent show, and it is a major production. They bring in people from miles and miles away, as the thousands gather that are hurting to receive healing from someone claiming to have the power of the Holy Ghost. A person pretending to be a conduit of God's power uplifting himself and making a claim of having special powers. But beloved, this cannot be true because Romans chapter 2 and verse 11 states very clearly God is no respecter of persons. One of the biggest <coughs> tricks of the devil today is to fool people into thinking that miracles are going to happen in our lives through the hands of some great leader in our society today. The one you're watching behind me can blow his breath and wave his arms and people just fall to the ground. Whole groups of people will fall to the ground. But beloved, the only time in the Bible, when we're, when we're looking at biblical miracles today, where anyone fell backward to the ground in any religious sense happened in John chapter 18 and verse 6. And they were the enemies of Christ that fell backward to the ground. Jumping around and uncontrollably in biblical days was a sign of demon possession. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 20. Many are confused. And so let's look at biblical miracles today. The effect of miracles on eyewitnesses. I want you to, as we begin... Look with me and see the certainty of the convincing element because of what they had seen through a biblical miracle. The first it is the testimony of sight. In Acts chapter 8, verse 13, Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and he was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. He had been trying to fool people prior to this with his parlor tricks and magic. Now he sees the true power of God, and this once magician is amazed at true power. We can look at the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 4 and verse 16, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all, all who dwell in Jerusalem. And listen to this, we cannot deny it. Biblical miracles were instantaneous. They were immediate in their healing. And those around them would see that outward power of God to where that they could not question. And even those enemies of the Lord couldn't deny that a notable miracle had taken place. Nicodemus is another example. 
In John chapter 3 and verse 2, he states, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. And why did he say that? Because those miracles were visual. They were and could only be described as something that went against nature, a state that one person has is in, all of a sudden to a totally different state without the aid of medicine. Pharaoh's magicians give testimony of where this power comes from. Moses is presenting those things that God has brought and God is doing those things. Exodus 8 and verse 19, Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. Big G. Did they believe in the big G God? No. They had ten gods for all different kinds of things. Their gods were discredited with those plagues that were sent upon them. They knew that a notable miracle over and over again had been done in their very presence. There was no question about it. See, friends, when you see a real biblical miracle, and we notice these things in, in, in the Word of God, we see that the heart of the eyewitness is affected. Now, it's affected in different ways. Sometimes, hearts become hardened. Notice Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 20. So I will stretch out my hand, God says, and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. All my wonders, all ten of those plagues, after which he's going to let the children of Israel go. But during those times of the plagues, as one would ease up and another would come into play because of the hardness of his heart. Listen to him and, and his stubbornness in Exodus 8 and verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, this is before the last one, he hardened his heart, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Over and over again, he would harden his heart, even though he saw that a true miracle had taken place. Sometimes hearts are softened. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the designer and the builder of the hanging garden from the seven wonders of the ancient world took Israel into Babylonian captivity, or Judah. Seventy years they were in Babylonian captivity. Notice here in Daniel chapter 3, verse 19. Well, what happened was, let me give you some background first. He built, had a, a statue built, a gold idol, and told everyone that when the harps and the flutes and all these things played, everybody in the nation had to bow down to his idol. So now, verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury because these three uh, followers of God would not bow down. And the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And by the way, that was the punishment. If someone did not bow down to that golden idol that was made, they would be cast into a fire furnace. So he makes it seven times hotter than normal. But notice when he sees a miracle, a true biblical miracle that he cannot deny, how his heart changes. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God 
except their own God. So now he's praising the God of heaven. Blessed be the God, the true God. Some witnessing the same miracle reacted in different ways. Maybe they believed it was a miracle, and yet the response was different. The common Jews were looking for a Messiah. They were hurting and suffering. And notice in John chapter 11, verse 45, many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. Here we have the raising of Lazarus from the dead. An undeniable miracle. Outwardly visual miracle. They were always outwardly visual over and over again. So they believed in him for salvation. But the chief priests and the Pharisees, they also believed and they had a different reaction. In John 11, 47 through 48, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. Not many so-called signs or could be signs. Many signs. He, they said, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in it. Why? <coughs> because the miracles were undeniable. They were proof that the message was from God. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Some that witnessed these miracles were simply unmoved. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the city in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. You mean to tell me someone can see a biblical miracle and be unmoved and not, not reach out for that salvation unto God? Yes. You mean someone can see a biblical miracle and get angry about that and harden their heart? Yes. If a biblical miracle doesn't have that kind of effect, then what should be our motivation? Friends, our motivation and our power for salvation is the gospel. Romans 1 16, Paul says, I'm for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and salvation for everyone who believes the Jew first and also for the Greek. So we don't have to experience a miracle to be saved. And the truth is many of those who experienced such in the days of the working of God through miracles they still didn't repent. Whole cities saw this stuff. Most of the works of God they didn't repent. Just like days of old, miracles today would not convert people. But they do have a purpose. And their purpose for being is important. Let's look at the use of miracles in the Old Testament in the Bible. Creation, number one. Genesis 1. Creating something from nothing. Now that's a miracle. All we can do today is invent things with what God has already created. It's like the fellow that tells God that he can make a human being. God says, okay, go ahead. He picks up the dirt and God says, get your own dirt. We can't make something out of nothing. But God can. Second, miracles in the Old Testament were sometimes used for deliverance. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 22, the children of Israel walked through the Red Sea with walls of water, the Bible says, on both sides, standing up as walls as they walked across on dry land. Could you mistake that as a miracle or not a miracle? You would know for sure that is a miracle. Sometimes the miracles in the Old Testament, number three, were used for divine judgments. Sodom and Gomorrah was a wicked place. 
And because of their unchanging attitude and their wickedness, God decided to make them an example. And through a miracle, in Genesis 18, 20, 19, 12 through 29, he destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain round about them with fire, it says eternal fire, from heaven. And I mentioned before that the sulfur that was created from that fire, those sulfur balls, are different than sulfur created anywhere else in the world. God made an example of those folks. Divine judgment. You're there one minute walking around, and the next minute you're getting rained on with fire from heaven. It's a notable miracle. In fact, you think about Lot's wife. She turns around and looks, and she's not supposed to. She immediately turns into a pillar of salt. Is that a miracle? Yes, it is. It's external. It's no way. There's no way you could question that. Sometimes, Old Testament miracles were used for punishment. Although Miriam had come out of Egypt with Moses and Aaron, Miriam questioned Moses before the people. Really, it did question God and his plan for the people. And so we learned in Numbers 12, 10 through 15, that one minute Miriam is standing there and the cloud is down upon the altar. When the cloud lifts, you look at Miriam, she's got leprosy all over her body. He has leprosy. Moses intervenes and he goes away. But notice in 2 Kings 5, 26 and 27. Now I said all over her body, maybe on her hand. I, I didn't go back to check that for sure. But this guy had it all over him. 2 Kings chapter 5, 26 to 27. Elisha was dealing with a guy named Gehazi and Gehazi was so bad that Elisha, he's standing there one minute cold, struck it. God through Elisha, strikes him with leprosy. So then he's standing there and he has leprosy all over him. After which, Elisha told him that all of his descendants would have leprosy. So that would be a continuing miracle. But notice there is not something on the inside. Okay, you, you heal a heart condition. You healed a, a, a bladder ailment. You, you healed a lung problem. You see the difference between biblical miracles and the so-called healing that we have going on today. You never and will never see the things that we're looking at here, these biblical miracles in today's world. Sometimes we see miracles being used as to, to bring sustenance to the people of God. In Exodus chapter 16, 4 through 35, manna rains from heaven for the people to eat, and water flows out of a rock. Both miracles of God. There was no water. We know this was a double miracle because the people were angry because they, they didn't have water. Their cattle didn't have water. Their children didn't have water. They were able, they saw the water just spring out of that rock. And this wasn't just a little bit of water. This was enough to water all of the children of Israel plus cattle. When just prior to that, there was no water. In 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 6, Elijah has prayed for famine. Is going on against Ahab and, 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 and Jezebel and their kingdom. Elijah's hungry. Well, he's sitting by the brook. God has provided the brook for his drinking water. But he's hungry. You know what? A miracle occurs. Ravens, birds, these ravens, every morning and every afternoon, fly in and drop him meat. And bread. Where they get the meat bread? I don't know. I guess God, you know. And they may have gotten it off the of Ahab window seal or something. Or God may have just created that. He can do that. Something out of nothing. But can you imagine being fed by these birds? Just, they just fly in, drop you a nice deep old steak and some good old garlic bread. And there you are. You can eat and drink your water by your river and have it made. It's like clockwork. 
the message of God. An angel of the Lord, or the angel of the Lord, came to, to like I say, let us know, to Manoah. And Manoah wanted to offer a sacrifice. And so he got a goat, he killed a goat, he put it on an altar. And one minute, the angel of the Lord's standing there, he looks like a man standing there with Manoah. The next thing Manoah knows, he floats up into the smoke of the altar and flies up with the smoke and disappears. Friends, that's a murder. From one state to the other. In 2 Kings chapter 20, 1 through 11, God wants to use Hezekiah. And he tells Hezekiah, or Hezekiah asked him, you know, to show that this is really from God. Uh, help me believe that. And so God says, well, you know, I, I can make the shadow of the sun go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees. He said, well, there's really no great thing for it to go forward 10 degrees. Or the shadow goes forward all the time, doesn't it? He's talking about their clock system. You know, he's got the... Uh, Oh, I just went blank. The uh, sun died. And so the shadow moves as the sun, as the earth goes around the sun. Well, he says, well, let's go 10 degrees backwards. So that shadow went 10 degrees backwards. God did something with the earth and its rotation or the sun and moved back that rotation 10 degrees. Folks, that's a miracle. There are three uses of miracles in the New Testament. We're going to notice one this morning, and then we'll notice the final two tonight. So you are encouraged to come back. Number one, it was to show the deity of Christ. In John chapter 20, 30, and 31, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Well, then why do we have these biblical miracles? These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So they confirm the deity of Christ. In John chapter 5, and verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And in chapter 10, verse 25 of John, Jesus answered him, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me. Well, how do they do that? Friends, miracles bring out our Lord's deity in five areas. Number one, they show his ability to know our thoughts. He knows what's going on in the minds of each and every one of us this morning. In John chapter 1, 47 through 51, we see this playing out. We'll look at another one too. John saw Nathaniel coming toward him, uh, excuse me, Jesus saw the thing you're coming toward him, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit or guile. The thing said unto him, Well, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Well, how did he do that? Because he's God. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Didn't take much to convince you out, did it? You're the King of Israel. So Jesus uh, answered and said unto him, Because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? This was going to be a very exciting time. You will see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Most assuredly I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open. The angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, as foreshadowed with Jacob's laugh. And in John chapter 2, 23 through 25, now when he was in Jerusalem, that's Jesus, at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name. Why? When they saw the signs, which he did, there's the purpose, Jesus. But 
Jesus did not commit himself to them. Why? Because he knew all men, and he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew what was in their heart, what was in their minds. The devil doesn't know that, by the way. He's not a mind reader, but God is able to do that. The second of the five areas is that they show his power over the elements. A great storm has taken place, or there, I don't know if the storm started after Jesus started walking on the water, but um, there's a storm involved here. We will just back up and notice the passages. In Matthew 14 and verse 25, in the fourth watch of the night, so here we are in, in late night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. He had been teaching and he had sent his disciples on uh, into the sea uh, in the boat. And then he is seen walking on the sea. Verse 29 says, So he said, Come, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So now not only is Jesus walking on the water, Jesus has allowed Peter to come and walk on the water too. Friends, that, there's no way that that could be anything but a miracle. Have you ever tried to walk on water? No matter how fast you go, you just can't walk on water. Matthew 14, 32, a little farther in the narrative. When, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. You remember, Peter looked around and he saw the wind, the waves, that storm out there, which was possibly going on to test Peter. Because immediately after the Lord took his hand, they went into the boat, and the wind ceased. One minute it's blowing and just going crazy, and the next minute it's calm. Friends, that's a miracle. Matthew 14, 33. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. What convinced them? The undeniable miracle. His deity is also brought out in a third way. Miracles show his power over the spirit world. In Matthew chapter 8, beginning of verse 28, when he had come to the other side to the country of the, this is spelled differently in different translations. Um, Gergesenes, we'll just call them. There met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them there was a herd of swine feeding. So the demons begged the Lord saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. Look at the power that God has. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. We see God's power over the spiritual realm. Even the enemies of God are in subjection to His Son. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 32 and 33, And they went out, and behold, they brought to Him a man mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. Don't you think there had been faith healers and things up to this point? Yes. In fact, there had been folks that some had followed as being the Messiah because of the tricks that he had been playing. In fact, the leaders thought maybe Jesus and his movement would come to nothing because of uh, the previous ones that did. These miracles are different, so they make the statement. Never been seen like this in Israel. 
can't deny these miracles. But also, number four, see and through miracles is his power over physical problems that chose his deity. In Matthew chapter 11, 4 and 5, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. Well, what was Jesus doing? The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. We don't see any of those things happening with modern day miracles. And number five, miracles show his deity with his power over death. In Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. So he's on his way to heal this, or to raise this little girl from the dead. Suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind him and touched his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Jesus turned around. When he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Instantly, when Jesus came into the ruler's house, Saw all the flute players, the noisy crowd wailing. Back then when someone died, they hired mourners. He said to them, make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. Why did they ridicule him? Because she was dead. They knew she was dead. They had cleaned her body. She was dead. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in, he took her by the hand, and the girl rose. And the report of that went all over the land. True biblical miracles are totally convincing. We believe in miracles and the purposes for which they occur. Friends, don't be fooled when advertisements are printed in the papers and mentioned on radio and on the television and internet of a healing service and all the wonderful things that can be done through a man who has been somehow anointed by God for that very purpose. Today's miracles cannot be verified. Today's miracle workers never raise the dead. Not once has a blind person been immediately restored to having sight. Not once has a person with one leg miraculously had two. See, friends, people are hurting, they're willing to believe anything, and they are gullible, and they buy into these false things, and the devil, friends, deceives he deceives through psychosomatic cases, through deception, through delusion, and fakery. Often convinces people through hysteria that they feel the Holy Ghost working in their lives. But friends, it's a major production. It's a moneymaker today. Biblical miracles were not for that purpose. Did not have that desire. And they have fulfilled their purpose, as we will notice tonight. But there are two more reasons for miracles in the Bible. One to show the deity of Christ, and tonight we'll look at the other two. Now, if we have already piqued your interest in becoming a child of God, doing things the way God has stated them in Scripture, understanding about Bible things and Bible ways, then we would love for you to become a child of God, be a part of the Lord's church, 
you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to repent of your sins, to confess His name before men and to be immersed in the baptism, we will rejoice together as the Lord adds you to His church and you have all those sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb. God has not hidden things from those that are seeking truth, but He will allow people to believe and follow a lie if that's what they want to do. Friends, I encourage you to stand on the solid rock of truth, to believe the things that are brought out in the Scripture, to understand them as truth, and to not be sucked in to the modern religious age that have leaders who will one day stand before God and Matthew 7, 21 will come into fruition because they were not found faithful unto the Lord. Look at your life this morning. 